get started. Uh, for those of you that have been blessed with evaluations, just leave them on the table. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to be able to be here today. Things have changed since I trained back in the days when anybody that looked reasonably sick got a swan dance catheter. Now there's all sorts of modalities for monitoring the patient, monitoring patients without quite what we used to do. And so I'm delighted to be able to introduce Steve Conrad, who I don't need to introduce because I think he's a member of every faculty here. Uh, but introduce Steve, to talk about invasive and non-invasive monitoring. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Uh, for the record, I think we got rid of the PA catheter just a little too soon. I'm going to actually address that to uh, just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to um, talk today about really just two modalities of monitoring, and that's going to be blood pressure monitoring and cardiac output monitoring. And I uh, was I uh, chose this topic because it's one of the most uh, misinterpreted and uh, misunderstood set of technologies that we have in the ICU uh, and without a proper understanding of how it works, what the potential errors are, then you can lead to uh, improper treatment of the patient. And I have witnessed significant improper treatment uh, based on, on evaluations or assessments from, uh, from the newer technologies and the older technologies as well. So my disclosures, uh, medical director for A-Lung Technologies, but that is totally irrelevant to my, to my presentation today. I will be mentioning some brand names because there are a limited number of brand names and each one represents a different technology and therefore uh, that's unavoidable, but there is no promotional intent uh, uh, with, uh, with, with this. My other disclosure is that um, I look at things often from a different perspective, because I have a degree in engineering. I spent five years working on that degree, uh, and my dissertation research was actually in signal and image processing, which is very pertinent to, uh, to today's lecture. Now, and you may think, you know, engineers are nerds, and you would be right 20% of the time. Actually, be right 80% of the time. <laughs> be wrong 20% of the time, okay? But my goal today is to focus on some of the pitfalls in monitoring, uh, how to identify them, and uh, what we can do about them. Sometimes we can make adjustments, sometimes we can make corrections, but often we have to just live with the information we have and understand that it may not be ideal. So my first premise, and I'm going, the first um, item that I'm going to bring up today, and this, if you take anything home today, it's the next slide, okay? And I think this is really true. When you're approaching monitoring in the ICU, you're relying on uh, electronic systems, fluid systems that uh, based on a number of assumptions and work well under ideal conditions. And it'll be up to you to identify when those conditions may not be present. But my first, the first topic I want to go over is blood pressure measurement. This we don't pay any attention to. We go see our patients, the nurse has it hooked up. We have to put in the line, <clears throat> but they, they hook it up and uh, they tell us uh, your blood pressure is such and such. And the goal is for you to decide whether you can believe that number or not. And I'm going to show you that more often than not, you should not trust that number. Okay, basic uh, transducer design. These are now disposable devices. The, um, there's a, the fluid path where the blood goes through. There's a little membrane that deflects with pressure. That gets converted electronically on this side to an electronic signal, and that signal it gets uh, reported out as a, as a waveform, as well as a set of numbers, systolic, diastolic, and mean. But, but um, while this process is very accurate, the process of transduction 
is extremely accurate. It's what goes into the process, what goes into these transducers that makes a difference. And the system that surrounds this transducer is also going to be influential. So let's look at a normal aortic pressure waveform. So this is the one we saw in the physiology textbooks. <clears throat> you have a rise with uh, ventricular ejection to a peak pressure. Closure of the aortic valve results in a diacritic notch, and it falls back down to diastolic pressure. Simple enough. So notice, what I want you to notice about this waveform that you'll, you'll identify in coming slides is that this is a somewhat rounded systolic uh, portion of the systolic, the systolic portion of the curve is, is somewhat rounded. You also notice that the diacritic notch is up where it ought to be because as pressure falls, the valve closes right away, so there's not much of a delay before the diacritic notch comes in. And this is visually can be one of the clues for identifying problems that I'll show you in uh, just a bit. Now, here I'm gonna take the, uh, the prerogative of introducing um, an engineering concept, but it's basic, and I, I, think, I think it's um, easily understood and will help you to apply these principles. Any signal, any periodic signal, such as an arterial waveform, uh, is actually the sum of multiple frequencies. It may be sum of one or more. If you have, in these uh, sine wave frequencies, so if you have a single frequency in a signal, sine wave, then if you were to do what we call a power spectrum analysis, where we actually turn the signal and look at the frequency. You can look at this right graph, and the frequency is on this axis right here. And the power spectrum tells us how much power is behind that frequency. If you have a pure sine wave, and that is one frequency, you would expect to see one little spike, one value on this power spectrum. You can throw in additional frequencies. Here, they're thrown in at five kilohertz. We could say five hertz, you could say in at 10 hertz, and you'll see a 10 hertz signal superimposed on top of a five hertz signal. And likewise, you can throw in a 20 hertz, and you can see that one superimposed. But the point is, the, the, uh, the, the value of these frequencies and the frequencies themselves added up can make any waveform that is periodic. Arterial waveform, <coughs> a respiratory waveform, anything physiologic or, or physical uh, is composed. So this, un this allows us to, uh, to think of things in these terms of frequencies. We can even simulate a waveform that doesn't even look like anything like a sine wave, a square wave. And here what you have is just an infinite number of higher and higher frequencies. And as we add the higher and higher frequencies, it converts this sine wave into more of a square wave. So that's the, the, the fundamental concept behind this slide, is when we look at signals, we have to think of frequencies. And that's going to play an important role. Now what does an arterial waveform power spectrum look like, or frequency spectrum? It looks like this. Here's the frequency along the bottom axis. <laughs> this is normalized units. This is basically one. And then this is a log scale for decreasing power or decreasing contribution from that frequency. Where is, what is the most prominent frequency here? The highest is right here. Okay. That's at about between one and two hertz. Hertz is per second. If you take that per minute, what do you get? 60 to 120 per minute. That's the heart rate. This is the fundamental underlying heart rate. So this is one way that you can use either computer algorithms or electronic algorithms to determine heart rate without measuring an R to R interval, which can be complicated in and of itself. And there are other frequencies added in that mold this 
one, this, uh, this one to two hertz sine wave into something that resembles uh, the actual arterial waveform. Another thing to remember is that once we get above around 15 to 20 hertz, all this information doesn't really add anything visually or uh, clinically to the arterial waveform. So we're only interested in what happens down in this region right here. Now there's another little blip right here. It's much smaller. It's at a much lower frequency. It's less than one hertz. It's probably in the order of 0.3 hertz. What might that be? That's the respiratory variation on the blood pressure. So you can get a lot of information from uh, power analysis uh, using, using these techniques. So let's move on to what we see at the bedside. Uh, what we would like to see is a normal appearing arterial waveform with a somewhat rounded systolic, plat uh, systolic peak, a diacritic notch that's fairly close to the systolic and we expect to see no sharp spikes. Now, I'm going to introduce the concept of damping in just a minute, but we have an overdamped signal. An overdamped signal is one where the higher frequencies are suppressed. It's, it's only allowing the lower frequencies. So what you'll see is your waveform in an overdamped system will begin to look more like that sine wave rather than an arterial waveform. And I'm going to also talk about the concept of an underdamped signal. And that is where you see these spikes. And you notice that this systolic pressure here is roughly 140. This measurement right here is roughly 160. Okay, and this is going to, this is going to, I'm going to be bringing this out more significantly. And our diacritic notch is moving now more towards our diastolic pressure. So visually, this waveform does not look like it should. The strong peaks, the sharp systolic curve, and the movement of the diacritic notch. On the overdamped side, you don't even see a diacritic notch because that's a higher frequency that's just dampened out. So the culprits for all of this are multiple. Uh, one, uh, we attach a long pressure tubing, three feet, between the pressure transducer and the arterial catheter. Yeah. Although this is a low compliant tubing, it adds in a small degree of compliance. Uh, it's a small diameter, and we also have a small gauge arterial catheter. These, as you'll see, all contribute to accentuating higher frequencies they produce what we call resonance. Resonance is a condition in a repeating system where uh, higher frequencies can build upon themselves. Okay? You, you see this in a, uh, in a waveform. I mean, in, 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 the, in the ocean, for example, when two waves come together and they join and they, they, uh, can, the ripple effect is a result of both of those coming together. Well, in this setup right here, uh, pressure waveforms are absorbed by the compliance system, and then they're pushed back into the system. So you can get energy that is stored and released in these systems that can then alter the frequency content. So when resonance is introduced into the system, what you'll see is a sharp spike at that higher frequency where it shouldn't be should be right down here, and it's introduced right here. And that adds a higher frequency component. And that is what is responsible for this right here. And notice that this difference of 160 to 140, that's, this is typical. This is not an unusual case. This is what you will see at the bedside uh, if, you, if you have the system that's under damped. So uh, I'll be coming back to this curve in just a bit. When we have a system that is prone to resonance, uh, one thing is to either modify the system so that it doesn't resonate, but we can't really do that for reasons I'll show you. But we can add in uh, damping systems. And a, a perfect example of what a damping system is, 
is a shock absorber in, in, a, um, in an automobile. And you see the cars going down the road like this? When the shocks are bad, the shock, when the shocks are out, there is no damping. And then when they hit a bump, what happens? It even gets higher and higher and higher. And every bump makes it go higher and higher and higher. Well, that's the type of effect that I'm talking about. So if we have resonance in our system, we can eliminate it through the process of damping. And when we look at the time response to a, a change in a signal, this is time, and then we introduce some change, for example, in blood pressure, for, uh, it could be just as simple as opening up the transducer to atmosphere and then turning it back on. What you would like to see is that the signal goes from its original uh, value to its new value fairly smoothly. If you have an underdamped system with a resonance, what you'll see is this type of activity. If it's slightly underdamped, it will get back to its, uh, to it, to its desired target. However, if, it, it, uh, if the, resonance, the, the resonance frequency is within the realm of this signal, you may even see this type of activity, where it never actually gets back. So the concept of damping is going to become important because when we can't control the, an underdamped system directly, we may have to apply damping to try to achieve this response. So proper damping can reduce resonance. You can take this underdamped signal and you can apply a mechanism for damping and you can end up with a normal signal. Okay? You've not changed the underlying signal, you've only removed the high frequency components that were artificially added in. So this is in, still an accurate representation of the process. It's not an artificial manipulation of the signal. And the way, one of the ways that uh, we used to be able to do it here at, uh, at LSU and UH, or actually at LSU before UH, was that the manufacturers would put in, in their electronics, an electronic filter. And it would allow you to specify what we call the cutoff of a low-pass filter. A low-pass filter means that, <clears throat> that anything lower than this frequency is allowed to pass through, hence the low pass. And anything above that frequency is cut out. So if we had a resonating signal at, say, 18 hertz, we could put in a 15 hertz cutoff, and you could totally eliminate that resonance and convert this to this. Okay? The problem is we don't have this in our monitors. So the monitor system we bought does not allow, does not have this incorporated into it. Uh, we have Nihon Koden. Uh, Space Labs, for example, does have this built in and allows you to dampen that. So we are, for the most part, now stuck uh, with having to look at these primarily underdamped signals. And I would say that over 90% of our arterial lines, our arterial monitors, are underdamped. Now, uh, we'll get back to how to treat that. Another aspect that, um, that we have to deal with is where it, it's, it's very, it, it makes a difference where you put the arterial catheter in. And what are we really interested in measuring? What part of the arterial system do we want to know? Yeah, we want to know what's happening at, in, the, in the central arteries because that's what's perfusing all the other organs. We don't care what the pressure is in the, in the radial artery because that's just perfusing the hand. We're worried about, about the big guns. But when you, as you get away from the aorta and you place your catheter further and further away into smaller and more distant arteries, and then you see the following changes. One, you will see a rise, an increase in the systolic pressure. Okay? And that's, that's because the resonance that I talked about that you, we see in our monitoring systems is also present in our arterial system. Our arterials, arteries have compliance, 
And so they can store and release energy and they can send waves backwards up the arterial system that can join the waves that are coming down and produce an increase in the systolic pressure. And so as you go from the aorta to the brachial to the femoral to the radial down to the DP, you will see this effect more and more pronounced. The other thing you'll see is that the diacrotic notch gets further and further away from the systolic peak. So that's so that's a visual clue. Now, this is a properly damped waveform. So here I'm showing you with a properly damped system, not an underdamped system. So even despite that, we see, we, so we don't see the spikes like an underdamped system, but we do see the value of the systolic blood pressure going higher and higher. And that value is pretty significant. <clears throat> it, by the time you get down to the dorsalis pedis, it is about 20 millimeters of mercury higher. And at the radial, we're talking around 10 to 12, maybe as high as 15 higher. With nothing else other than moving that art line away. Now, if you think about it, gee whiz, if the arterial pressure, if the pressure here of 100 is, 120 is higher than 100, how come blood's not flowing back? Should be right. That's that's kind of, that kind of a clue that something can't be right. Uh, what, but what is happening is that the mean pressure is dropping slowly with with distance, so that here uh, we don't get we don't actually get reverse flow in our arteries. We're actually this is an artifact of measurement, and our mean pressure actually drops throughout the arterial system, uh, and that is what provides the flow, uh, the driving pressure for flow. The effect on the diastolic is much less. Here we see a drop of 10. So an increase of a, to go from the, um, to a distal artery, uh, you see an artificial increase in the systolic and an artificial smaller decrease in the diastolic pressure. <clears throat> now, one thing that is pretty true uh, there are cases where it may not be true, but one thing you can rely on is that um, all of these effects from underdamping, overdamping, and where you put it in the arterial system only affect the higher f the frequency components. It does not affect frequency zero. Frequency zero is your mean pressure. So if you were to dampen this out totally until it reached the mean pressure, then you would see this drop in pressure. So you can, for the most part, uh, put faith into the mean arterial pressure. Okay? So that will, that's not affected by underdamping or overdamping. It's affected slightly by where you put it in because you do have a drop. So you will have a lower mean pressure in the radial than you will have in the aorta. Slightly lower, maybe five millimeters of mercury. It's not going to be terribly, and it could be more if the patient is on vasopressors. You could have a larger drop in that pressure. Uh, but the, one of the take-home points is that if you have to trust any number on an arterial waveform, you can only trust the mean pressure. All right, not to say I'm not, a, you know, people who know me know I'm not a fan of radial artery catheters. I've shown you the physiologic reasons not to. You now see some of the clinical reasons. I have personally seen three of these in my career. Um, and it's one of the things that is, in addition with what I just reported to you, is the reasons that I've gotten away from using radial art line catheters, at least for long-term <laughs> monitoring in critically ill patients. Patients going to anesthesia, fine. They like radials because they can get to it at the bedside. It, um, but you have other options for monitoring as well. So that's the reason I go to a larger vessel. The, uh, the femoral is a larger vessel. Uh, another vessel that you can get access to that was popular in the 80s, but haven't seen it used much lately, is, a, is the axillary artery. Uh, it kind of fell out of favor back then because there were some complications of hitting the brachial plexus. But ultrasound has taken away that, and I would submit that the axillary artery is still 
a good option for uh, monitoring in the ICU. Another thing you have to be careful about is what happens if you partially kink either the catheter or the line. If you kink it incompletely, then you can see a rise in pressure. You won't see much change in the waveform, but all the pressures will be up. When you calibrate it, it calibrates properly, but your values are still off. What, what might be causing this? If you look at the, at, at our, at the uh, transducer system, you have <coughs> that line coming in from the patient, there's the catheter, you have the transducer itself, then you have a bag up here. Okay. You ever look at that bag of saline up there, pumped up to 300 millimeters of mercury? It has a little trickle valve that allows three cc's an hour to get through. And it, the purpose of that, the three cc's is low enough that it normally does not affect uh, the blood pressure because it escapes out the system without any resistance whatsoever. But if this is kinked, and is kinked sufficiently uh, to impede this flow, then some of this pressure will be transmitted to the transducer, and you can see this happening. And you won't have any idea this is happening unless you examine your system. Because there's no clues to it. I mean, you, when it, it zeroes properly and everything looks good. But so just be, be tuned into that fact when you have patients who just have who maybe large discrepancies in blood pressure. But this doesn't happen terribly often, I have to admit, but it's something to be aware of. Now another Another aspect of arterial pressure monitoring is where we place our transducer. So nurses are taught to place it right at the level of the heart, the phlebostatic axis. That sounds really cool. Uh, and in the supine patient, what that means is there is no hydrostatic pressure added to your system, either in the upper body or the lower body. But when you put a, pa a patient in a semi-recumbent position, then you have to take into account hydrostatic pressure. Gravity is going to add a significant, a, a clinically significant amount of pressure to your transducer. And so if you maintain, you put a patient in the semi-recumbent position, and you maintain your catheter where the nurse is taught to put it, <coughs> and you will want to monitor cerebral perfusion pressure, then what's going to, how are you going to be overestimating or underestimating? Well, if you measure right here, you measure mean arterial pressure of 60, and uh, you're, you're trying to, to um, target, let's see, let me get, let's just make this 70 and you're trying to target a CPP of 60, and your ICP right now is 10, okay? You'll reach that. But however, what is the pressure up here at the brain? What is the distance of this fluid column? It's gonna be 20 to 25 centimeters, which is 15 to 18 millimeters of mercury. So the pressure up here is going to be 15 roughly uh, millimeters of mercury less than what you're measuring here. So if you think you're measuring cerebral perfusion pressure, you're not. You have to move the transducer up here to the base of the brain because that's where the arterial pressure is that's entering the cerebral circulation. So how many times have you got your pressure transducer down here and you're happy with this map of 70? Well, this patient actually has a cerebral perfusion pressure of 45, okay? All right, another thing, I'm just gonna throw it up here because it's a nice fancy curve and the engineers like curves, but we, we do have uh, non-invasive blood pressure measurements. There are a number of types. There are types that fit on your fingertip that measure your pulse continuously. Uh, and then there's through, through non-occlusive techniques, and then there's the occlusive technique that we put usually on the upper arm that uh, inflates and deflates and then monitors the pressure oscillation.
And this it gives you a pretty accurate result. It may not differ from the typical Korokoff sounds that we're taught to use, but even those Korokoff sounds may not be accurate. This, is, this actually may be more accurate uh, than listening to by auscultation. Uh, but there is still some assumptions here. The assumption is that the peak value, peak oscillation occurs at the, the mean arterial pressure and that they look down the curve at 74% lower and they call that the diastolic and they look up at 61% and they call that the systolic pressure. So it's, um, it's and, and, so, and these are, this is an algorithm built in, so there is some room for error in this type of system, but they're pretty reliable. Uh, and then the question comes, if you have a patient in the ICU and your oscillometry blood pressure doesn't match your arterial blood pressure, which one do you believe? I guess the answer is that depends. If you have a properly set up and dampen system, we go, and it's in the right place, we tend to, we, we say that the arterial, invasive arterial pressure is more accurate. <clears throat> but if you have an underdamped or otherwise improperly set up system, this may be more accurate. So uh, you're gonna have to clinically decide when you see a discrepancy, uh, which one to believe. All right, let's talk a little bit about cardiac output. Uh, the, the gold standard, while well, I'm here, any questions on blood pressure measurement? Nope, okay. So everyone gonna look twice when they go to the bedside, right? Okay. All right, uh, the, the gold standard for measuring cardiac output is indicator dilution. This uh, is, is a, is a uh, technique in which some indicator is injected into a flowing stream. So for our purposes, we're injecting this into the circulatory system. And downstream, we measure the concentration of that substance. Now, one premise and one, one assumption that, that, that has to be maintained for this to be accurate is that whatever you inject into this system has to stay in the system. If it leaks out, then your concentration down here is lower and you'll overestimate the flow in this system. And that'll have some relevance to, to a slide down the road. When we, when we uh, perform this measurement, we see a curve that tends to look like this. They are sharp upstroke. But what's happening here, as the dye is moving down, you might inject it as a bolus, but as it's moving down, it tends to distribute, so its concentration drops a little bit, and it starts to diffuse in either direction. So you end up with the bolus looking more like this. And then as this bolus flies by the sensor, it records the concentration. Okay. Now, how is this curve related to flow. Well, the area under this curve represents the total amount of substance that has gone by uh, in, and includes a, a factor of time. So the, the actual value, the actual top value is gonna be uh, dependent upon the concentration that you put in as well. So conceptually, here's how you think about it. If you have a very high flow that bolus is going to shoot by very quickly. So it's going to come and go very quickly. If it's going by very slowly, that bolus is going to be picked up and it's going to hang around a lot longer. So that kind of gives you an idea that the area under this curve is related to the flow, but inversely. So if you have, if you see a, a, a indicated dilution curve that is spread out, you know your flow is lower compared to one that is not. Right. The original uh, physiologic measurement of cardiac output in humans was performed what we call the dye dilution test. Used a green dye 
which was a dye that could be measured photometrically at the bedside. And the green dye would attach itself to albumin, so therefore it would stay intravascular. It itself is a small molecule, but since it attaches itself to albumin. And we would inject a bolus. You can inject it into the venous system. It doesn't have to be in the pulmonary artery. But you injected it somewhere in the venous system, and on the arterial system, you would measure that curve. And that's all it took. You just had to have a way to measure this over time to reconstruct that curve. And now, uh, green dye has gone by the wayside, and it's been replaced by lithium dilution. So the lithium detection is what we use now. And these are commercially available. We have one in the pediatric ICU. And uh, from a physiological approach, the, the flow, the cardiac output, is equal to the area under this curve, or rather the A is the amount of substance, the amount of dye that you inject, divided by the area under the concentration curve. And that's it. It's a very simple measurement, uh, pure physics, and it just works. And that is complicated, okay, to, to have that system that reproduces. So the concept of thermal dilution was introduced, <clears throat> a little more complex. And what thermal dilution does is instead of, it, it substitutes heat or lack of heat for the dye or the lithium. And it, you inject a bolus of saline that differs in temperature from the blood. And so that difference in temperature is the actual, is related to the actual amount of heat that you're injecting. And then you measure in the pulmonary artery further downstream the temperature. And you get the exact same kind of temperature curve that you would as concentration. And you can, this equation right here is exactly the same as the previous one I showed you that looked more simple. Uh, here's the area of the temperature, but temperature is not what we have to measure. We have to measure our quantity. And so we include the specific heat and the density of the saline. And that converts temperature to quantity of heat. And likewise on the top, the amount we inject is the difference in temperature times the volume we inject times the specific heat of that injectate. So these calculations are all taken care of by the cardiac output computer. And there are some minor correction factors for how much heat is lost in the catheter as you inject it and so forth. So, but still, this in, in the clinical medicine is considered the gold standard for cardiac output, some type of indicator dilution. And in the ICU, we tend to use thermal dilution, but lithium dilution will produce equally accurate results. You have to measure temperature in the pulmonary artery. You can't measure it on the arterial side like you can with lithium. The reason for that is one of the assumptions that I mentioned is that whatever you inject has to stay in the circulation. If, this, if you were to measure on the arterial side, it would be after this bolus passes through the lungs. And so uh, you would... You would lose heat, you would lose, uh, you, would, you would gain temperature, lose heat into the lungs, and so that's not valid. And there are systems that can do that, but they make a lot of assumptions, um, and therefore aren't nearly as accurate and aren't considered a gold standard. All right. Uh, this has been modified to provide continuous cardiac output. It's actually not continuous, it's actually intermittent, but it's very frequent. Every couple of minutes, it may, takes a measurement. And instead of injecting a cold bolus into the right atrium, there's a thermal coil that sits in the right atrium. And that thermal coil uh, generates heat in proportion to the amount, the amount of heat that's generated is, uh, rather the amount of heat generated is proportional to the current. So by knowing the current it puts into the coil, it can figure out how much heat it's generating. And so it will heat up for a short period of time. And during that time, it will monitor the temperature at the end. And a very similar equation to injecting cold, except it's just inverted, 
the difference is what counts. And since you're not injecting a bolus, we don't know the volume of that bolus, we substitute uh, the amount of power that the system puts into that coil uh, to make that difference. So um, that's all I have to say about PA catheters, other than the fact that I really think they have gone away for the wrong reason. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But what can you get from a PA catheter? You can get accurate cardiac output. That's the gold standard. You can get accurate mixed venous oxygen saturation. We substitute uh, right atrial, or we substitute sometimes even superior vena cable. But you have to recognize that, uh, that the inferior vena cava generally has a lower saturation than the SVC. This may be 70%. This may be 75. Not that much different. So if you stick your catheter somewhere in here, you're going to get a measurement that's pretty clinically acceptable. As, but as you go into shock, this is going to go down. And in fact, there are studies that show some of the earliest signs of shock or a divergence of these two saturations. And therefore, if this were to go down to 60% as opposed to 75%, then you can have significant. But by the mixing in the right ventricle, by the time it gets out to the pulmonary artery, you actually have the most accurate measurement of mixed venous. You can also measure accurately pulmonary artery pressure. This is critical if you've got someone in right heart failure. You want to be starting a vasodilator, put them on inhaled nitric oxide or flow land, and you want to know what your response is. The, the most accurate way to detect that response is how you can affect the pulmonary vascular resistance, which is going to be related to your pulmonary artery pressure. And then we can also, using modifications of the technique to actually measure the volume and diastolic volume of the right ventricle, which is probably a much better uh, correlate of right ventricular preload, not left ventricular, right ventricular preload, than is central venous pressure. But things that are not so helpful from a PA catheter, right atrial pressure and pulmonary artery pressure. I don't have the graphs here, but if you were to plot cardiac performance versus CVP or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, you would get no correlation. There is no correlation between wedge pressure or CVP and cardiac output or cardiac function, I should say. Now, <clears throat> what the study that said PA catheters don't help you in the ICU, looked at what? They looked at this as a measure of preload. And the data was already out there. It is not a measure of preload. And it's not a measure of preload responsiveness. So based on a false assumption about this, about what these values represent, uh, a large study was conducted. And the conclusion was PA catheters aren't useful. Indeed, they are quite useful. You just have to know why they tended to go away, and it was just bad assumptions. Okay? So if you're going to use a tool, you have to know how to use it. Let me shut this thing up here. Right. Now, some of the newer non-invasive or minimally invasive techniques I want to go over. Uh, we have a pulse contour cardiac output. Uh, there are, uh, there's a subset of those uh, that are uncalibrated. By uncalibrated, I mean that um, uh, they don't make another measurement of cardiac output and then calibrate the system to that measurement. The, the flow track uh, uses pulse contour analysis, so it has an algorithm. This is a very simplified version of the algorithm. It's actually much more complex that examines characteristics of the pulse contour, makes some assumptions of things such as compliance and whatnot, and then derives a value uh, equal to stroke volume, which it can then calculate cardiac output from. And then we have calibrated systems. These do a similar type of pulse contour analysis, but they periodically allow you to, they allow you to calibrate this uh, to a, a gold standard of cardiac output. Uh, one, the PICO 
system calibrates against thermal dilution cardiac output. However, it tries to measure cardiac output at the artery. And if you remember what I talked about, losing heat. So even though it makes some adjustments for that, it introduces some additional error. And then the other one, the LIDCO, uh, does a calibration through lithium dilution, uh, which is much more accurate. And you'll see in some of the data how that makes a difference. But the point is, um, assumptions are made because this is only an algorithm. And an underlying premise is that an uncalibrated system is going to be more prone to error because there's no way to, to calibrate it. Uh, and and it, if you're operating outside of the conditions under which the algorithm was developed, you're going to have more error. So let's look at uh, a comparison. This is Michael Pinsky, who's a uh, well-known uh, clinical physiologist and critical care physician up at Pittsburgh, who looked at, who compared these three systems and looked at, uh, these are Bland-Altman plots, so <clears throat> what represents here is the, uh, the average cardiac output, and this represents the error <coughs> associated with those measurements. Excuse me. <coughs> and you can see this is the, uh, the PICO system. Uh, it has errors that were, most of which were within two liters per minute. Okay? I mean, reasonable, but two liters per minute may make the difference between a clinical clinically important decision and not. And there were some values which were really outliers. <coughs> the, the LIDCO system, which is the calibrated system, performed much better. It was still up to two liters off, but it, it was a much tighter grouping uh, than the other system. <coughs> and FlowTrack is not too dissimilar from the LIDCO. It, it uh, had a little wider range of error, uh, up to about three liters for 95%. Uh, values, but it still has some significant uh, errors as well. And what I've been teaching, in which I actually learned it was not the case until I looked at some of the data, was I've been teaching that even though the absolute value of these may not be off, they, may, they should trend more appropriately. And this data doesn't support that, but theoretically it should. And if I had to put my faith in and these non-invasive systems, I would put my faith more into the fact that they should trend better than get, uh, more accurately than they would give you an absolute value. But there were some outliers, as you can see, with these three systems. But for the most part, they, they trended reasonably well, uh, but still you could get errors that could alter uh, clinical decisions. So what affects pulse contour analysis? Well, one of the things that these systems are factory calibrated at is a properly damped system. Do we have damp, properly damped systems at University Health? No. There's no way to get it because we don't have the system anymore that can <coughs> prevent that under and over damping. Um, one of the big culprits that produces uh, alterations in, in damping is that, I think I showed you a picture of it, the VAMP. Did I show you a picture of it? And that device that we draw, that just throws everything out of kilter. That automatically means you do, you do not have a properly dampened system. And so if you really want to get real about, about measuring bedside pressure, and we don't, since we don't have a way to do electronic filtering, you got to take that VAMP out and, uh, and remove it. Now, there are studies that show that it doesn't have any effect, but I have personally taken a vamp out of a system and shown significant improvement in, in, in uh, damping. Uh, the location of the arterial catheter in the arterial system, the more distal you get, and the pulse contour changes, and therefore the assumptions, so it's, it's, they're really calibrated for properly damped, more proximal measurements. And then you have someone who's got poor vascular compliance because of age or calcifications, that alters a number of things. And uh, the use of vasopressors can alter vascular compliance. And all these things can produce uh, some error. So another technique uh, which is, which is non-invasive as opposed to minimally invasive, there are a couple of techniques. 
The first one is called thoracic value impedance. Uh, this was kind of commercially came out in the 80s, but it wasn't widely adopted and therefore didn't make it, it didn't, didn't pan out to be uh, clinically useful. So it's still around, but it's not used in, in critically ill patients or hospitalized patients. It's used in things such as exercise physiology and so forth. So in normal, healthy individuals, it's pretty accurate but <clears throat> not in hospitalized patients. And what it does is it injects a, um, a low frequency current to the, across the chest, and then it measures the impedance, the resistance, if you will. As, you, as, as fluid in the chest increases, then the resistance goes down. We may be done in two minutes, <laughs> um, and, and vice versa. So what this measures is the increase in thoracic volume from stroke volume, okay? And so the assumption is that this volume change represents stroke volume. But it's also sensitive to any intrathoracic blood volume, pulmonary edema, ARDS, and so forth. So clinically, it correlated poor with uh, critically ill patients. So it's still pretty accurate, but it's now used primarily for out-of-hospital applications. And the newer kit on the block that's been around about 10 to 15 years is thoracic bioreactants. It, it actually uses a different technique, uh, which improves its reliability somewhat. It, instead of measuring impedance, it measures the phase change of the reactant signal. So it measures change in phase between the applied signal and the measured signal, not the amplitude uh, for measurement of impedance. And the best analogy is that uh, you get an improved signal strength because bioimpedance is sort of like AM radio, where it looks it's amplitude modulation. And Frequency modulation is more akin to the phase shift here. And which one would you rather listen to? You, 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 everyone here knows the difference in the quality between AM and FM radio. So it, um, it has undergone some testing. Um, patients on cardiopulmonary bypass has shown a pretty good correlation, post-operative patients. Um, so most of the publications out there include folks that are actually part of the company. So you have to take that with a little grain of salt. Now, uh, so in, in fairly homogeneous patient populations, it correlates pretty well. Uh, and here's another, another uh, publication. We looked at post-op cardiac surgery patients. And this looks really, really tight. But if you read between the lines, each one of these dots is an average of 40 measurements, so it's, it's bringing down the variation quite a bit. And when and this was put into, um, into actual uh, clinical ICU, this is Daniel Debacher and Jean-Louis Vincent from uh, Belgium who, who made a series of measurements in truly sick patients, septic shock, cardiogenic shock, ARDS. Uh, the correlation was not nearly as good, and this is for um, pulmonary artery catheter, cardiac output, which is our gold standard, <clears throat> and this is the bioreactant. So in critically ill patients, there's a number of things that can go wrong that uh, can, can make um, errors in our measurements. So are these systems useful? Yes, but you must correlate these with clinical findings. <clears throat> I put this in here because uh, at least one of my fellows will know this. I came into the ICU and there was a patient, clinically was in shock. Cold extremities, lactate was still up, and the measured cardiac output was 11. So I got, got I said, this just this doesn't fit. And so if that scenario occurs, if the clinical picture doesn't fit with your measurement, you have to investigate. Because it may be one of those instances where the, on that particular patient, there may be a poor correlation. And so what we did was we took uh, echocardiography and we made an assessment of her cardiac output. Now that's probably within a 20% error in itself, but we got about 3.5 uh, to 4 liters per minute. That's a huge difference. 
So most patients are going to be much closer than that, and some will be dead on, but it's possible for them to be way off. And that's where you have to, to uh, question and you know, recognize the limitations. So I'm going to jump now to, uh, I'm about done, cardiac output. Uh, this is the, the technique we actually used on that patient <coughs> to, to measure um, cardiac output. Uh, you can do an apical view, echo, just throw the Doppler in the aortic outflow track, measure the area under that curve with a little tracing on the echo machine. You get, and that's called the volume of velocity time integral. That's equal to the stroke distance, that is how far down the aorta the blood is pushed out. And you can multiply that times the cross-sectional area of the aorta, and you have stroke volume. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> uh, this, most of the error in this measurement actually comes from measuring this. That's why I said plus or minus 15, 20 percent. But you can avoid measuring this if you're interested just in stroke volume variation. And you can continue this tracing long enough through the respiratory phase, and you can then make a calculation of stroke volume variation by using just two measurements, the min and max of ETI. And that will also give you stroke volume variation, which I'm not going to talk about today, but it's a measure of preload responsiveness. So and with echo, I'm not going to echo is a whole other talk, but just to wrap up this talk, um, hemodynamic monitoring with echo can give you a lot. And so that's why we incorporated it into our fellows' training. It can give you cardiac output, SVV, preload and preload, predict preload and preload responsiveness. You can get an estimate of pulmonary artery systolic pressure only, and it's just an estimate, but plentifully useful. You can look, measure uh, effects of right ventricular afterload, contractility, uh, ventricular interdependence, and whether right ventricular volume overload can impact your left ventricular function and a whole host of other things. So that's going to be all I have to say on ECHO. Um, I'd be glad to give another discussion on, on, on that if you're interested. So to wrap up, uh, remember, question everything, uh, trust no one, but also recognize that the truth is out there. <laughs> you just have to know how to find it. And I'll leave you with this quote, and hopefully you may be relating to this right now. You may not. But, uh, Thank you for uh, your attention. Right. Any, any questions? What seems to be the comment that the Lydian system is uh, more precise, I mean, putting words in his mouth there, than the thermal dilution technique, which seems just physio from a physical perspective to be illogical in that the, there's so many more variables between injecting into the venous system and then taking it out of a brachial artery than there are, uh, you know, six inches apart. Um, is it just because the lithium is is absolutely stays completely bound and is is uh, so precisely measurable? And if so. Do you wind up getting to a point where you've measured so much that you've got enough lithium in the system you can't do it anymore? That's, you know, that's actually two questions, right? Sorry. <laughs> um, I either I misspoke or spoke out of context. The lithium system is more accurate than the thermal dilution <coughs> system when you, you measure it in the artery, not in the pulmonary artery. So the thermal dilution through a pulmonary artery catheter is as accurate it's the same accuracy as the lithium system. Oh, okay. okay. Right. That's the difference. But if you okay. do thermal dilution by measuring the temperature in the artery, uh, it, it, it absorbs heat into the extracellular water. <coughs> you can get great measurements of extracellular, of uh, intrathoracic water volume, uh, but it reduces the accuracy of the cardiac output measurement. And so the, the, the uh, PICO computer tries to use information from that loss of heat to figure out how much water and make some adjustments for it. But again, it, it's an adjustment. But, but no, the uh, thermal dilution pulmonary artery catheter is, is, it would give you the same results as, as LITCO. Okay. The beauty of LITCO is, is you don't have to put in a pulmonary artery catheter, which I think is a shame. <laughs> so I, think, I think there's a role. To the second question then, do you, do you, run, or, do you run up against the wall at some point where you've 
measured too many times, yeah. and, and now you've introduced noise into the system by your measurements. Now what you're referring to is a concept of recirculation, yeah. because lithium doesn't disappear right away. Uh, and if you were to look at a cardiac output curve with LITCO, you would probably actually see something like this. <coughs> and this is the recirculation. That's where it's coming back around and hitting again. Um, so what, but what happens is this eventually distributes. And so if you want to make another measurement, you have to start with the baseline <coughs> so that, and readjust that baseline. You can't assume it's zero. You have to actually measure it and start with that measurement. Okay. And that's how that's fair. <coughs> All right, Dr. Conrad. Um, One comment on thermodilution: you have to be aware of that it is not accurate if there is any intracardiac shunt present. Uh, that will throw off your thermodilution curves. Beautiful. Um, what what he's referring to is the fact that remember the assumption I said is whatever indicator you put in to measure, it has to stay in the system. So anything that allows the indicator to leave the system before it gets to the, uh, to the transducer uh, is going to affect the measurement. And what he's referring to specifically is an intracardiac shunt, where it may leave through the shunt rather than going out through the pulmonary artery. And when that happens, the total amount of quantity that it's measuring is actually smaller than what you injected. And therefore, you will have a smaller area under the curve, and you will overestimate cardiac output. Another place that can become problematic is in when severe tricuspid regurgitation, where the bolus just regurgitates back and forth, and then over time loses heat to the exterior of the vascular system. So um, mild to maybe even moderate tricuspid regurgitation probably give you pretty accurate results, but any intracardiac shunts that result in a right to left shunt is going to be inaccurate. Left to right shunts also will dilute it. If yeah. your shunt is greater than 1.2 to 1. Right uh, right uh, left to two cardiac chambers to, yeah. uh, to make a recording. Yeah, left to right if it's between the injection and the measurement. Which it has to be. Which has to be because you're injecting in the atrium and you're measuring in the pulmonary. So no matter where the shunt is, it's... And that will do the opposite. That'll make you underestimate your blood flow. Okay. Anything else? All right, thanks.